starting with the gospel according to Luke, Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5. So Luke chapter 5, starting with verse 1, the word of God says, One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, the Bible says they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he, had, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for entrusting us to go on another journey with you as you open our hearts and our minds to unpack the anatomy of a follower, what does it mean to be a follower? What does it take? What does it cost? What is the reward? So Father, we humbly come before you right now as students ready to learn from you, the teacher. Bless us now. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen, amen, and amen. So we're starting a series called Follower. Follower. Now when I was growing up, being a follower was often used in a negative way. In fact, parents would often tell their children, don't be a follower. But Timmy did it. Oh, if Timmy jumped off a cliff, would you jump off a cliff too? Don't be a follower. In fact, it's on that graduation day when the keynote speaker tells the class that is ready to depart their, 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 their time uh, at a university, a college, or a high school, it is now time for you to be leaders, the leaders of tomorrow, the leaders of tomorrow. No one ever says to be the followers of tomorrow. Leaders. In fact, we raise our children to see themselves as leaders, not followers. But can we keep it real? <laughs> Man, we always following, right? Following trends, following after the most popular thing, the color powder. I, if I want to know how to decorate my place, I just have to walk through Target. Target, Target, excuse me, always lets me know what colors are in. Not Macy's, not Nordstrom's. No, it's Target. Target will tell you these are the colors that are in and I want to follow. Back in the 80s, I was a big time follower. And the 80s was such an eclectic decade. I mean, the styles were changing like every single year. I remember when, when all of my friends that had hair my, like mine, had my texture, were wearing jerry curls. Want to know why we were wearing jerry curls? Because Michael Jackson was wearing a jerry curl. And, you know, if you have my kind of texture, 
uh, uh, you know, you could pick out your hair and it would be a nice afro, but it didn't move. But the jerry curl would give you the possibility of having hair that can move. You just needed to have some activator. I know I have some people here who, could, who are witnesses to that. Boy, you put some activator in that, boy, you could shake your hair. Stuff would be flying all over the mirror. It didn't matter. I was a follower. I wanted to look like Michael Jackson. I wanted to wear his jackets with the zippers. Jamon! But times changed. We got out of that phase, and before you know it, I was following after Prince, trying to wear a little bit of lace at school. Can you imagine that? It's the 80s. But I, I grew wiser. I was told to be a leader, but I'm still following, and it was cool to be a skater and surf and wear certain uh, 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 outfits that, that communicated that you were a skater. And I started changing the way that I would talk. I'd be like, what's up, dude? Hey, man, can you ollie? Can you suss, dude? Right? Gnarly, man. So I was doing that, acting like that, until that was no longer cool. And then, you know, 89, I mean, all that stuff was just whack. You had to start sagging the pants a little bit more. You know, Marcus, this was probably way before your time. So you, you, you grew up more in the skinny jean era, man. We were, we were sagging our pants back then, man. And we had a certain little walk like we had hurt ourselves. You know what I'm saying? You started looking at people like they were trying to start something with you. What you looking at? No, what you looking at? Man, you know where I'm from? Bruh, I'm from Loma Linda, California. You don't want to mess with us. Loma Linda. I was claiming Loma Linda. LL, man. Followers. It takes a long time for you to be comfortable in your own skin where you're not chasing after people, trying to, trying to engage those that will, that will affirm you and, and, and make you feel like that you're, you're welcomed and that you matter and that you're worth something. We're followers. But then we get to a certain stage in our life where, again, comfortable in our own skin, understand our identity, and, and we don't want to be the one following trends. We want to be the one who is the trend setters. We want to be able to forge our own path and have people follow us. Oh, yeah, everybody can be a trend setter, setter now. Everybody can have followers. You just have to have a social media account. Someone friend requests you. Someone's following you on Twitter, on Instagram. You can feel pretty special in everything that you say, everything that you do. And everybody becomes kind of an expert, right? Everybody's like has their own master class. I just want to show you how to put on this makeup. It's something I tried out. I just mixed these two colors together. Right? And you just have tutorials all over the place. So we live in a very confused world, right? We're, we're raised to be leaders. We're told to be leaders, but often we still keep following. But when we look at the Christian message, the Christian walk, and we look at discipleship and how Jesus calls us into service, what Christ is looking for, now watch this, it's going to hurt you a little bit. He's never calling people to be leaders. He's calling them to be followers. Followers. Can I be honest with you right now? Not everybody's going to be a great leader in this church. Not all of you are equipped, qualified, gifted, trained to be a leader. Some of us are just going to be good followers. Some of us will not be shepherds. We're just going to be good sheep. And I want to suggest to you that often that is the goal. Not to be a great leader. Some are called to be, but not to be a great leader, but to be a good follower. So in this story, this first introduction with uh, Simon Peter, John tells us his name is Simon, and Jesus just straight up changes his name to Cephas. That's in Aramaic, which means rock. In Greek, it's Peter, Petros. 
just changes his name on the spot. Like, yo, my name is Simon. Not anymore. <laughs> I'm going to call you Pete Rock. Is that all right? In Matthew, in Mark's account, the very first words Jesus says to Simon is follow me. Like, there's no introduction according to these authors. It's just straight up, follow me. He just sees Peter fishing, follow me. And the Bible says in Matthew and Mark that they dropped their nets and they followed Jesus. Now, that just doesn't seem very realistic that, that they didn't know who he was, knew nothing about him. So Luke kind of gives us a little bit more intel on this first encounter with Jesus. Yes, he does say, follow me, but there's something that happens in their interaction that I believe lets Jesus know that Simon, who we would later call Peter, and I'll be re uh, referring to as Peter from here on out, there's something about this interaction that I believe lets Jesus know that Peter is the one he wants to follow him. And there's something about Jesus that lets Peter know he's worth following. So can we unpack that a little bit? Well, I'm going I'm to say something from the very beginning that I think is absolutely important. The reason why I believe that Peter is willing to follow Jesus is because he was a great leader. He was absolutely a great leader, and there's something about what he observed that let him know I can drop everything and follow him. But I want to look at what the DNA of a great leader is so that we can understand what it means to be a good follower. I believe what makes Jesus a great leader is that he was also a good follower. What makes Jesus a great leader, what made him a great leader, is that he was a good follower. And most of us don't focus on that aspect of Jesus' ministry. Because again, we, we are trained to just look at leadership as the pinnacle. If you can be great in life, then you must lead. You, you're, people are going to want to be just like you. But what made Jesus a great leader is that he was a good follower. Now, there's a lot of debate on how Jesus arrived at the place that he did where he would be considered rabbi. Depending on what accounts that you read, Jesus is most likely an uneducated person, meaning that he didn't go through the, the, the school of the rabbis. He didn't learn in the traditional way. But there are some accounts in the Gospel of Luke that would make you think that Jesus had gone to some type of rabbinical school that, like most kids his age or those who could afford it, uh, where he had a rabbi that was instructing him and he was following after him. But I just want to point you to a couple of texts that give us a little bit of insight on who Jesus was. Can we do that really quick? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. The Bible says, and starting with verse 1, Mark chapter 6, verse 1 says, Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples, his hometown, Nazareth. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Now understand this. Not anybody could just teach in the synagogue. You had to have training in order to teach in the, in the synagogue. The, the leader of that synagogue had to know what your credentials were to trust you with teaching in the synagogue. So he is given this, uh, this, uh, this honor and this responsibility to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that he has that has been given him what are these remarkable miracles he's performing isn't this the what the carpenter isn't this mary's son and the brother of james joseph judas and simon aren't his sisters here with us and they took offense now why did they take offense because jesus did not go to seminary jesus did not have his phd Jesus was not trained in the way of the other rabbis, the teachers of that time, the, the teachers of the law, those who ruled in the synagogue. They're like, who is this man? Who gave him this wisdom? How can he perform miracles? Isn't he a carpenter? Now, in other gospel accounts, they'll say, isn't he the carpenter's son? So who is this man? Let's go to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. This is when Jesus was a little bit younger. This is a story that most of you know when uh, Mary and Joseph left Jesus uh, in Jerusalem when they went to go for the Passover. 
They decided to head back home and then looked in the back seat and realized that Jesus wasn't there on his iPad and had to go back to Jerusalem and search for him for three days. Uh, Luke's account says in, in verse 46, says, After three days they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them. What does the Bible say Jesus was doing? Listening. He was learning. He was listening to them. He was 12 years old and he was listening to them and he was asking them questions. Little boy Jesus was learning from the best, right? Now, some may say, some may say, yeah, but that was just a one-off. Well, most likely not a one-off and most likely Jesus' family could not afford to send him to one of the universities, uh, you know, what would be the equivalent of a university in their day. And so Jesus took advantage of any time he could speak to a professor, he would. Jesus wasn't a normal kid. He wasn't like, yo, what kind of Pokemon cards do you have? Oh, man, I want your Pikachu, right? Now, that's not what Jesus was doing. He was walking down to the universities and speaking with the best of the best. So he was listening and asking questions and the Bible says uh, the Bible says everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers meaning that they were asking him as well hey young man I have a question for you and Jesus was answering theirs let's go down to verse 51 and 52 it says then he went to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them but his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and Jesus was a learner. I know this is hard for many of us to grasp, right? You know, there, there are some that have said that the only person who taught Jesus was his mother, Mary. I believe that Mary taught him. I believe that Joseph also taught him. He was learning from both his parents. But Jesus didn't exclusively learn just from Mary and from Joseph. And I believe that he also learned from God, from his father. We have, we have scripture that tells us that, where Jesus says, I, I didn't get this from anybody. I got this from God. Everything that I say, everything that I speak, I get from the father. But we can't ignore the text that suggests that Jesus was also learning from his surroundings. The book of Hebrews says that Christ was made perfect in, in, uh, in uh, chapter 2, verse 10, that Christ was made perfect through suffering. Hebrews 4, 15 says that he was tested, tempted in all ways, yet he did not sin, meaning that he was going through a lot of things that people were going. The reason why he could be our advocate, our mediator as a high priest is because he went through the stuff that we went through. I believe that Christ understood what education was. But Hebrews 5, 8, verse 9 says this, son though he was, I love this, son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Christ learned what? Obedience through what he suffered. He learned obedience. This is really difficult for us to grasp because Jesus is God, right? According to John chapter 1, he was the word that became flesh. He was with God in the beginning and was God. But we have this beautiful text in Philippians. In Philippians, Philippians, go there real quick. Philippians chapter 2. I know some of you are like, we have not sped through the Bible this quickly. It's on the screen, don't worry. It says, verse 6, who being in very nature God, this is talking about Christ, this is Paul, who being in very nature God, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. So Jesus was God, very nature God, meaning, all right, please listen, we have a long time to spend with one another. If it's up to me, I, I will be here for over a decade, okay? I hope you like me. I'm going to say things sometimes that are going to probably hit you a certain way, but, but can, can I share something with you that may sound new to you, but it really is just Scripture? Jesus in heaven wasn't the Son Before he came to earth, he was God. 
We just read what Paul said. The very nature of God. He wasn't less than. Christ did not take a subservient role until he was born here on earth. That's just scripture. I know that sounds a certain way because I know most of us like to believe that from the very beginning, Jesus was always saying, Daddy, Daddy, what are we going to create next? The role of father and son happens because of what Jesus chose to be for you and I. He chose to become nothing so that we could have everything. And it's an irreversible change. Jesus will never go back to his pre-incarnate experience. He will never be like he was. The disciples said, you know, hey, are you going to come back? How will we know you? As you see me leave, I will come back. You will see the scars. You will, you will know who I am. An irreversible change. Jesus will always look like us. And so Christ takes on this subservient role. And this is really important. This is why I tell you, in order to be a great leader, you must first know how to be a good follower. And Jesus was a good follower. He grew in favor with God and with man. He learned to listen, ask questions. He learned from his father as a carpenter or artisan worker. He, he learned from his mother. He learned from people that were around him. I'm sure there were uncles and aunts that spoke with him. I believe Jesus took advantage of every means of learning. And this is how he became perfect in his obedience. And this is really important for us to know. There is nothing about you that is so amazing, so good, that you cannot learn from one another. I don't care how many doctorates you have, how many PhDs you have, we always must have a posture to learn. A posture of being a good listener. And Jesus was a great leader because he was a good follower. And he humbled himself to a place where he could be that. Okay, so we got this part about Jesus. Okay, great. All right. Great leader, because you're a good follower, awesome, wonderful. Why would you want Simon Peter? Well, before I even tell you why he would want Simon Peter, can I just say something that I like? I didn't want to use this as a point. I, don't, I didn't want to because it didn't seem that deep. But it really is when you think about it. Can I just, can I just pause for a minute and just say this? Isn't it beautiful that Jesus wants you? That's scripture. The Bible actually specifically says that he called those he wanted. Can I just, can I bask in that for just a minute? Jesus wants you. He just wants you. <laughs> he wants you on his team. I just love that, that he saw Simon Peter was like, I want him. All right, all right, all right. So, so here Jesus now is ready to call Peter, Right? Now, most likely, many of the people who were fishermen and shepherds were people that could not hack it out in school. They just could not reach and attain certain levels of excellence. And, and they did not have a rabbi who wanted to train them. Did not want, they didn't have a rabbi that, wanted to, that even viewed them as a pupil. So many of these men in the society would love to be, would love to be a rabbi, would love to teach in the synagogue. This was the highest, most esteemed position. This is where you got the most money. Money. the most praise the most adoration every young boy wanted to be elite like this but these folk that Jesus is talking to uh, they ain't a part of the elite group they couldn't make it in school their SAT scores weren't good enough and so Jesus Jesus wants them and I love this but I I have to say something real quick here. It's interesting that Jesus, on the mission that he's on, actually wants to surround himself with people who would be considered outcasts, delinquents, not good enough. Why would you even want to associate yourself with people like that? I mean, you're Jesus. You are the son of God. Like, you're the best of the best. Universes worship you. And you want to hang out with these folk? You want to be a great leader, you must have an ego that is small enough 
Small egos can handle big visions. Big egos, only small vision. Jesus is egoless. He's egoless, according to, uh, to, to Philippians 2, becomes nothing. So for him to look at a, a fisherman or a shepherd or an outcast like a tax collector means nothing to Christ because he doesn't care about status the way that you and I care about it. All he wants are people who are willing to learn. And if you have big vision, then you must have a smaller ego because only by opening up the influence around you by allowing other people to come around you who may not have the same economic uh, uh, status as you, who may not have grown up in the same uh, communities as you, only by opening ourselves up to others will we be able to have greater influence and greater impact. People tell me all the time, Pastor, you want to surround yourself with people who have your vision, that share your vision. Absolutely no. I do not want people who think just like me. I want people who are going to challenge me. I want people who are going to think different. How else am I going to grow if I'm only going by what I feel, by, why I, by, by what I think, or by what I understand the Holy Spirit, where I understand the Holy Spirit is leading? Jesus is willing to open himself up to all these different types of personalities, people who have been successful in their own way, in their own field, because Christ's ego is small enough to handle the big vision and doesn't see it as a Lone Ranger uh, 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 journey or, or mission. He says, I'm going to do this as a team. Somebody, you got to say amen on this one. Watch this, watch this. For us to do whatever we want God, for us to do what God is calling us to do in this community, for us to do what God is calling us to do in this church, it will always take a team effort. I don't care how pretty you look. I don't care how great you sing. I don't care what degrees are behind your name. I don't care how many years you've been in this church. And if your grandfather also actually laid like mortar and brick and all that other kind of stuff, if your ego is so big that you cannot invite people who wear skinny jeans, people who listen to different music than you, people who have a different experience, people who may not like church the way that you like it, it's always going to be a small vision. Big vision requires smaller egos so we can allow more people to be in the room with us. Somebody say amen on that. So Jesus is willing to check his own ego and say, listen, I'm, I'm going to cast my net wide. But what does he like about Peter? What does he like about Peter? The Bible says that Christ sees him uh, uh, washing his nets and Christ is preaching, teaching, and the crowd is becoming so large he has to get into a boat so that he doesn't get uh, uh, pressed up against. And so he's on a boat and asks uh, Peter to kind of just move out to the ocean, I mean to, to the water just a little bit more so that the people could gather around and he could have room in order to speak to them. And, and Peter, who doesn't really know Jesus like that at this moment, recognized something special about him that he allowed Christ to be in his boat and allowed Christ to even dictate what he ought to do. Now, this is the interesting part of the story that just blows my mind. After Jesus finished with his sermon, I imagine Simon Peter was there listening to the sermon was like, that's deep. That's deep. That man knows what he's talking about. That was a nice parable. Wow. I've never heard truth like presented that way. That's awesome. But then Jesus says, uh, let's go out deep. And bring your nets, the ones you just washed, the ones you were ready to put away for the, for the night. Let's go back out. We're going to get a catch. Now, this is where Simon Peter should have been like, uh, Jesus, <laughs> you stick to what you know best and let me stick to what I know best. Okay? <laughs> I mean, that's the way I would have rolled. <laughs> Jesus, I, I know you know stuff about the word, but you don't know video games the way that I know video games. So I don't really need your input. Lord, I, I, Jesus, I, I know you had some experience being a human being, but, you know, you haven't lived in this generation, in this type of culture. So why don't you stick to the things that you know, and I'll stick to the things that I know. I understand business. You probably would ask me to be poor or something. I know how to be rich. Can I just say something real quick? Jesus knows more about your profession than you do. Jesus knows how to be a better tax collector than Matthew did. Jesus is a better fisherman than Peter. Jesus is better at all these things. Can I just say right now, just, no matter where you find yourself in life, if you don't think that you're a person that's been called to be in the church and work in the church, can I just say something real quick? Being a follower of Christ doesn't mean you're always working in the church in an official capacity and you're holding an office. Being a follower of Christ might mean you are a better CPA. 
that you, that, that you are a better administrator, that you're a better councilman, councilwoman, that you are better at leading in a corporation. Being a follower of Christ, guess what? It permeates in all the sectors of life. We always think it's just relegated to church. Christ is like, <laughs> my church? My people? Yeah, we're, we're not barricaded by four walls. This kingdom is here and it's present and it goes on beyond these walls. And so Jesus knows more than you think he knows. So he tells Peter what to do and Peter says to him, I love this. He said, Master, we said we worked hard all night, we tried this, but because you say so. Oh, that's a good word. Because you say so. This don't make no sense at all, but because you say so. This don't feel right in any way, but because you say so. Oh, what would this church be like if we had people just like that? This don't feel right. Pastor, this don't feel right. I mean, I don't, one of them raised their hands as they were singing. This don't feel right. I'm not sure if we should spend this much money on this particular area in the church. This might not feel, but what if, what if, what if that all we want to do is simply be plugged into what the Spirit says and how God leads, not just what we think or what we feel. Pastor, I don't know if I can give this up. I don't know if I can give up how I've handled life all up to this point. I don't know if I can change the way in which I deal with these type of problems in my life, but because you say so, and if we have people who are willing to follow Jesus because he says so, oh, can you imagine the world, what it would look like because he says so? You ready, you ready to just envision with me? We wouldn't have one hungry person. We wouldn't have one homeless person. Should I go further? We wouldn't have murder. We may not have divorce. If we were simply all listening to Jesus because he says so, we might have heaven here on earth. Father, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven because you say so. Family, when we adopt this posture, Jesus, because you say so, because you say so, good things happen. What happened with Peter? They cast the net into the water. You, you read it. We just read it. You saw how many fish jumped into the net. Jesus had greater powers than Aquaman. So many fish, they had to invite some of their compadres to come out and help them. And their, their nets were also full. You see, when we listen to Jesus, when we follow Christ, when we follow Christ, not only are we blessed, not only are we blessed, but we bless others who are in reach of us, right? We bless others whose lives can also be a impacted for the positive because we've chosen to follow Jesus. Oh, I'm telling you something right now, fam. We're going to go in this series. We're going to get deep in this series. And I'm going to tell you something right now. What happens in this series won't just be an individual thing. What happens in this series will impact communities. It will impact homes. It will impact relationships. God wants our nets to be full. If he didn't want our nets to be full, can I say something? He wouldn't have come. Christ didn't come so that our life would be worse. <laughs> Hello? He came so that our life would be what? Full. He says it. I came to give you life and give you life abundant. That's the word of God. And so let's close on this. We're closing right now. The Bible clearly says that after this, uh, uh, Peter's response is that I'm a sinner. Get away from me. I'm a sinner. Get away from me. Get away. You're too good. You're too good. Get away. Get away. Get away. Most of us are afraid to follow Jesus because we don't think we're good enough. But can I say something? It's the reason why he asked you to follow him. Because you're not good enough on your own. Right? It's the reason why Jesus calls you to follow him. I'm not good enough. Duh. That's why he calls you. But I think I'm going to fail. Uh, yeah. And that's why he calls you. But what if I don't measure up? You won't. But that's why he calls you to follow him. 
Peter didn't realize it was precisely because he was a sinful man that Jesus called him. Your sins, your failures don't disqualify you from following Jesus. I actually think they equip you because they make you that much more empathetic and more relatable. How many people would say Peter's their favorite disciple? Most of us would. Most of us would. Why? He's relatable. So Jesus is calling you. Not necessarily to hold a particular position in this church. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's not. But where you work in government, he's saying, I'm calling you in that place. I'm calling you there. As you work for the city, as you work in the hospital, God is calling you right there in that place. For some of you who are working here and are feeling tired and weary, Christ is still beckoning you to follow him. Because you say so. You see something in me that I may not see, Jesus, and so because you say so, I will do it. And my sins won't get in the way of you calling me. In fact, that's why you call me. Jesus says, I want you to be fishers of men. Fishers of women. I want you to change lives. Follow me. There's someone here today that hasn't left everything to follow Christ. There's been something that's been holding you back from the possibilities. Maybe you are obsessed with simply being a good leader, and if you can't be a, the best, if, you, if your ego cannot be massaged enough, you don't want to, but Christ is calling you today. I'm not asking you to be a great leader. I'm asking you to be a great follower. Do as I ask, because I said so. Let me feel your neck. Let me feel your heart. Let's change the world starting with you. If there's someone here that wants to accept that call to follow Jesus, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as we pray. Very specific. Some of you are already following him. You don't need to stand. But someone here that says, yeah, I've been on the fence. I'm willing to start something new. I'm going to go on this journey of follower. I'm not going to be focused on leadership, but followership. If that's where you are, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as we pray. Amen. We got a young girl that left a message this week saying she wants to be baptized. Oh, I can't wait. Oh, I can't wait. Love that, especially when they're young. Love it. Somebody else, you want to stand to your feet as we pray. Amen. If you make that decision even while we were praying, and you may do so. Father God, your invitation is clear. You want us to follow you. And following you is not always following you because you're a great leader, but following you because you're a great example as a follower. We want to learn from you wherever you take us because you say so. And we're going to trust you. Although there's some that couldn't stand, they didn't want to because they didn't like the way it might make them look to their friends, to their family. They want to see themselves as already a follower and a committed follower. But Father, you already know what you're telling them right now in their heart. So continue to convict and to call them out into the deeper waters. Thank you. We hear your invitation. We say yes to it. 